On our last episode, I was introduced to some of Costa Rica's epic eco-adventure destinations. I explored the pristine Monte Verde Cloud Forest region, where I got up close and personal with a few of the locals. Then it was off to La Fortuna's jungle-infested slot canyons to check out Costa Rica's hottest extreme eco-adventure sport. And after an aerial tour high above Costa Rica's jaw-dropping ring of fire, believe it or not, we're just getting started here in this adventurous paradise. Costa Rica has defined itself as the ecotourism capital of the world. It's also the epicenter of adventure here in Central America. My name is Keith Newber. I'm an explorer, and I live for adventure. I grew up dreaming of exploring distant lands. Now, not only do I get to live out those fantasies, I get to take you along for the ride. Let's just say I'm on a non-stop adventure quest. My latest journey of discovery has led me here to the wilds of Central America, a land where the road ahead is paved with endless mystery and mind-blowing wonder. Exploration leads to discovery as American explorer Keith Weaver chronicles his epic journey through distant lands and exotic places, immersing himself in foreign cultures while exploring the fantasy land of lost worlds. Wild adventure. Join me as I explore the magic of Costa Rica. Pura vida. Costa Rica is the birthplace of eco adventure, and it all began with its backcountry rafting tours. I'm off to explore the inner depths of Costa Rica's Rio Pacuare, one of the most spectacular rivers in the world. From there, we head to the Caribbean coast to explore the protected shores of a unique wildlife refuge that's helping to conserve the endangered leatherback turtle. We'll meet these amazing sea creatures and find out what's being done to protect them. And later, I make my way all the way down to the Panama Canal, the southernmost point of my expedition through Central America. My first adventure takes me to Costa Rica's most quintessential tropical river. I'm traveling into the densely forested gorges of the Rio Pacuare with my man Warren. We'll explore a diverse ecosystem that supports an incredible array of wildlife along with its rapidly changing topography. Pura Vida, Warren, this is beautiful. This is the best river Costa Rica has to offer. Welcome to the Pacuare River. You're not gonna find a better river, greener river, more beautiful river in all of Latin America. You're gonna go underneath waterfalls, see birds, there's just animals everywhere. It's just an amazing river. I feel like I'm in Jurassic Park here, man. Thankfully, the Pacuare River is still natural, just the way God made it. It's beautiful. The Pacuare has it all. Stunning scenery, accessibility, and sections for every level of ability. In other words, there's something for everyone. Make sure the camera's ready to go, locked and loaded. It's not unheard of for experienced rafters to paddle the entire length of the lower Pequate in a single day. But if you're looking to take advantage of all the scenic splendor and thrills this river has to offer, multi-day expeditions are the way to go. <laughs> Stop, back paddle, at the same time, back paddle, everyone. Close atrás, close atrás. Stop, so when I say, oh my God, okay, bend your knees, and move your body in the boat and grab the chicken line. This is a chicken line, uh, the green line around the boat. When I say up, it's return to your positions. We're gonna use this command in shallow water in some dangerous part, okay? So, get down, uh, oh my God. Serious whitewater rafting enthusiasts know that Central and South America have some of the most spectacular rivers in the world. Costa Rica's Rio Pacuare just may be the best of the best. The Pequate is naturally divided with some of the more extreme sections of whitewater in the upper part of the river. Certain sections of the Pequate drop up to 100 feet per mile as it rips through some of the rarest pockets of unexplored wilderness left in the planet. After surviving the Rio Pacuare, it's time for a change of pace. So I head east to explore the coastal beaches at Gondoka.
Costa Rica boasts one of the world's best conservation records. What percentage of its landmass is currently under protected or reserved status? We'll check in a little later to see how you did. This conservation-minded corner of the world is proud of its rich biodiversity, and one of the most well-known creatures in Costa Rica is the massive leatherback sea turtle. Not only are leatherback turtles the largest, they're also the most widely distributed sea turtles in the world. I've landed here at the Gandoka Manzanillo Wildlife Refuge, where an organized team of volunteers are helping the endangered leatherbacks with their annual nesting ritual. To see these animals, they're prehistoric like dinosaur looking animals, to be able to be the person that is actually the one there with the hands on and you know, doing that sort of work, I, it's just incredible. It's, you feel so lucky to um, to be in that position where you're, where you're the ones doing that, especially if there's a tourist group out on the beach or something and they're sort of you know staying back and looking and you're the one there doing the work. It's just like, like that's amazing. And also being a critically endangered species to feel like you're doing something to, to help that. Um, the, the population numbers have decreased um, in the last 10 years by 80% and that's mostly to do with the human influences. Like the turtles have always had natural threats and predators but it, for the rapid decrease in the last 10 years is the human factors like um, bycatch and fishing boats, pollution, um, illegal harvesting of the eggs. So to know that a species like a, such an amazing animal, something that we've sort of caused this decline to feel like you're doing something to, to change it, then yeah, it's very satisfying. Scientists say there are between 26 to 43,000 female leatherbacks left in the world. Now to the average person, those numbers might not sound too bad. But the truth is that unless we mount a cohesive global conservation effort now, this unique species of marine reptile will go extinct within the next 20 years. I'm interested in knowing what kind of mating strategies this population has. Um, so basically what I'm doing is I'm looking if um, one nest has more than one father, or if it just has one father. In one region in Australia they found like no multiple paternity, so that means they were mating monogamously. And in, in Tortuguero here in Costa Rica they were actually mating polygamously. Now you have this area shaded, why? why? Um, because of the sex dependence in, in sea turtles while they're incubating, we don't want to affect the nest in one side or the other. Because, for example, if this nest would be exposed to broad sunlight the whole time, we would have a sex ratio kind of in favor for females. And what we're doing with the shade is we're kind of um, yeah, creating an uh, artificial 50-50 sex ratio. So the sunlight has an effect on if the turtle's going to be male or female? If it is 30 degrees Celsius, we're going to have females. If it's 29 degrees Celsius, we have males. One of the most unusual characteristics of the egg laying process is that the hatchlings imprint on the beaches where their mothers laid them. Because sea turtles know exactly where they were born, more or less, at least the region. So scientists don't really know how they do it, but it's pretty sure that they need an imprinting face. So if you would throw them right in the water, they might miss this face, so they might not find their way back. So this is the reason why we always give them like around 10, 15 meters on the beach to walk, to imprint the beach, to be able to return later on when they're grown up. Most leatherback females that come ashore to nest here average between four and eight feet long, and they can weigh up to 1,100 pounds. We divide this beach by sectors, so we have C, B, and A. And you have two hatcheries here? Yes, we have one in sector B and we have one in sector A down on the other end of the beach. Uh, we had around 600, between 600 and 700 nests, and we had in total 30,000 little hatchlings that left to the sea. The time for them to actually hatch is when the temperature drops at night. Because of course if you look around, during the day they would burn basically, they would get fried on the beach. So if, for example, they would make it to the surface during the day, they would just stay there, um, not moving, until it's gonna drop and then they're gonna go out and go to the sea. And what challenges do they have getting from here back to the well, sea? When they're going to the beach, of course, predators, birds, dogs, everything that's out here, raccoons, right. they're gonna feed on them. So it's, it's a tough road. It is, yeah. and that's also the reason why it's just, well, one part of it, why statistically, out of a thousand eggs, only one adult female is gonna be coming back to the beach. Out of a thousand eggs, only one adult will come back yes. to the beach. According to marine biologists, there are many challenges facing these gentle giants. The nesting process is one of them. Is this a nest right here? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a nest, that's a natural nest. There was one turtle coming up right in front of the hatchery, and we just put a canasta on top. 
we actually put um, the meta tags of the of the mother and the internal transponder that the mother has on the nest and also the date and normally also we have the number of eggs on on it and which leader relocated or worked on this turtle so we always know which mother belongs to which nest and they're way down there so yeah 75 centimeters and uh, normally like it's around 55 would be the earliest date they would hatch kind of depends on the weather up to 75 days that would be probably really really late hatch and um, you can see it actually already a few days in advance because they need around four days to make it up to the surface and you will see like a little crater uh, just a little collapsing and then you can tell that some of them cracked the eggshells already and they're just about to come up to the surface. It takes four days to get to the yeah. surface and then they've got to make it through all these obstacles to get back to the water. Yeah. <clears throat> then they've got all these critters out there waiting for them. Exactly. That's a, t that's a tough road to hoe right yeah. there. To say that a freshly hatched baby turtle has a difficult task of survival is an understatement. Once hatched, a baby leatherback must avoid birds, crabs, dogs, raccoons, even human poachers in its life and death sprint from the nest to the sea. Unprotected nesting areas lose as many as 95% of the hatchlings to predators. The lucky few that do survive to reach adult maturity find their way back to the exact same beach where they were hatched to resume their reproductive cycle. Well, hopefully all the, the great things you guys are doing here will, will have an impact. Yeah, I think we're actually impact. one of the few beaches that don't have a decreasing rate. We actually do have a little increase in our um, nesting. Well, you keep up the good work, okay? Thank you. We'll check in on you. There are about 500 nests currently being protected at the Gondoka Wildlife Refuge, thanks in part to the efforts of Widecast's volunteer program. This nonprofit organization has been in operation for over 20 years and currently has several projects up and running that they believe are making a difference. Because sea turtles are among the most migratory of all marine animals, when we see a decline in a local population, it's often a direct consequence of human activities. Everything from deforestation to poaching and pollution has a serious effect on all marine life, even from thousands of miles away. Widecast has determined that one of the greatest dangers to sea turtles around the world is that they are prone to eat plastic bags. These plastic bags mimic their main source of food, the jellyfish. And that's a major environmental hazard. You've got all these marine animals coming up to eat the jellyfish and they, what they think is a jellyfish and it's actually a plastic bag. You wonder where your trash goes. Well, you're looking at it. Widecast has involved its volunteers in a major recycling effort that has them weaving the bags retrieved from the oceans and beaches into useful, durable goods, such as handbags, clothing, and even jewelry. We propose they transform these plastic bags in this kind of uh, crochet plastic bags. Uh, for make one of these, they need at least 80 plastic bags, eliminating from the environment and putting again in the society by these very nice bags. And these are beautiful. I mean, these are every bit as beautiful as if you were to crochet these with fabric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the kind of uh, texture and the quality is, is very good. And uh, because we understand only uh, producing that kind of quality, we can export. Right now, we're exporting to US. The National Marilliam Center in Boston are buying our products. And the Sea Turtle Inc. in South Padre Island are, are buying our products. Uh, the Loggerhead Center in Jekyll Island, they have these products from or or uh, handcrafters. So the program's a hit. Yeah, right? of course. Yeah, we are producing for communities just in 2007 around $20,000 for and a community that in the past just have garbage in the coast. This is one uh, very nice history. This is in a product that we developed for a touristic agency because they in the past for the crisis people they give and a bottle of water. But they have hundreds of bottles of water. Now they are giving with this case. Now the people just open again and refill, reducing the number of plastic bottles that I, they are using. And this is just within a very small um, invest from the, the touristic company. They are reducing the plastic that they are producing by giving uh, bottled water to the people. The proceeds help to pay for further conservation efforts, which is good news for the endangered leatherback, not to mention Costa Rica's booming ecotourism industry. We still need to do a lot of things. We still need to educate people here. Um, the people that is more aware is the people that uh, benefits directly from tourism and these kind of activities. 
But I think the main problem probably will be in the cities, you know, in the main uh, city. We still need to educate people there about how important it is, you know, all the nature here, the environment, the rivers, the water, everything. Costa Rica's been amazing, but it's time to move on. I'm off to explore the southernmost country in all of Central America. Earlier we asked, what percentage of Costa Rica's landmass is under protected status? If you answered C, 25%, you are correct. Costa Rica is renowned throughout the world for its commitment to the preservation of its natural resources. Over half of the world's rainforests have been lost to deforestation or other destructive practices. At the current rate of decline, scientists estimate that our rainforests will disappear within the next 40 years. I am here to explore the route to change the world. Bordered by Costa Rica to the north and Colombia to the south, in Panama it's possible to visit two oceans in one day. The distance between the Caribbean Sea and the Pacific Ocean are less than a day's drive from coast to coast. In between, you'll find tropical beaches, virgin untouched rainforest, high mountain ridgelines, and impenetrable jungle. My first destination is the world-famous Panama Canal, which is perhaps the most well-known attraction in all of Central America. It's celebrated as an engineering miracle, a work of genius in its design and construction, and ultimately, a triumph of the human spirit. The Panama Canal is one of the largest and most difficult engineering projects ever undertaken. I'm here to find out firsthand what it took to build this one-of-a-kind waterway and how it actually works. I'm also curious to learn about the future expansion plans that have already begun due to the ever-increasing shipping demands on the canal. We make no less than $2 million in gross revenues per day. Just to give you an idea, last year our gross revenues were $1.7 billion and 14,721 vessels transit the Panama Canal. Yes, this is the uh, main pillar of the Panamanian economy. And if you have uh, any idea what it is, for every dollar that circulates in Panama, one third is related to the Panama Canal directly, indirectly, or in use. Uh, by the way, the one in the far west lane is a maximum size. It has capacity for 5,000 containers. It's paying above $267,000 in tolls. It has three Panama Canal pilots on board. Uh, they take command of the ship from ocean to ocean. Our senior pilots are right now taking command of the container ship. Meanwhile, we can see uh, liquid, uh, LPG, liquid petroleum gas, entering uh, the near lane or east lane. Uh, all these vessels are clearing the locks with only two feet at either side. It, it's worth to mention that it takes a career of 12 to 13 years for a Panama Canal pilot to command a maximum size like the container ship in the far west lane. The most advanced students will make the career in only 10 years. If we go back to 1914, they were visionaries. Uh, the, uh, the mechanism is very simple. All the waters come from the rain. 9,000 employees of this organization depends on the rainfall. The uh, rainfall is placed in the rivers and man-made lakes and provide fresh water for the operation of the Panama Canal. As you can probably notice, this tanker is coming in. As soon as the vessel is in position, we're going to close the gates at this turn and then transfer 26 million gallons of fresh water in 8 or 10 minutes from the upper to the lower chamber. It's the principle of connecting chambers. On the 3rd of September of last year, the Panama Canal Authority began the dry excavation for the brand new cell locks. It's the project of the century for this small country of 3.2 million inhabitants. After the French government first made an attempt to build the canal in the late 1800s, the United States government took over the reins under President Teddy Roosevelt. The work went full force in 1904, and the building of the canal was completed in 1914, a full two years ahead of schedule. 75,000 human beings were involved in the construction of the Panama Canal. Every uh, hammer, every equipment, everything was brought from the United States because at that time, Panama was just a beginning, a small country, very small country. The building of the Panama Canal was like the shot to the moon during the Kennedy era. Something that you must know is that uh, electricity was never used in a, in a mega project. General Electric has a, probably was a small company but had the vision to assign most of the employees for the electrical bits. It won the contracts and history was made. 
Since opening nearly 100 years ago, the canal has been a huge success and continues to be the key pipeline for international trade. However, due to its high demand and the changing size and shape of ships since the canal's inception, today the Panama Canal faces a number of challenges. And right now these channels only have 45 feet deep depth. The maximum draft on a ship is 39 feet. So what happens in the dry season, no rain, this lake, due to all the expelling of water from the locks, we lose about six feet. That only gives them clearance of one foot. So what we need to do is gain at least three more feet. So these dredgers are going up and down this channel and they are taking out soil, putting it onto these barges, removing the barge out of here, taking the barge and actually put, uh, dropping the barge in other places of the lake. The fact is the Panama Canal is in need of a major facelift. Billions of dollars are being pumped in to widen and modernize this engineering marvel. It's designed to allow for an anticipated growth in traffic, with the new locks expected to open in the year 2015. With this new set of locks, we will have tubs, rectangular tubs, say about three pools of tubs, and we will be able to pump the water into the lock system and pump it back. We're gonna be recycling water, we're gonna conserve water. And that's really important to the Panama Canal. We need this whole watershed that you see here. We'll obviously not be able to produce that much water for these mega ships. And for Panama in revenue, it's gonna be amazing. Right now we're somewhere about 4% of world trade. We'll get up to about 10% of world trade. And imagine just the job revenue. That's the key. We're gonna produce a lot of jobs for this country. 90% of our population knows about conservation. So having the canal was very important to set off all this conservation. We didn't become conservationists because we wanted to. We became conservationists because it was our number one natural resource was water and the Panama Canal. And then that's where the Panamanian people decided to wake up and say, you know what, we do have to conserve this. So people here um, are very well aware of conserving uh, the forests that we have in this country. That's nice. So the future looks bright. The future looks super bright. The sun is shining. Right on. Sure. Thanks, Richard. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks for yeah. bringing us out here. Fantastic. Good to have you down here. They live by the mantra, the Puta Vida, or pure life. As I embark on the second half of this incredible journey, I can only hope to discover more shining examples of conservation along the way. For more information on the expedition, visit amxhd.info.